Welcome back, my name is Ho Mai, and in this video we're going to walk through the preparatory homework number two assignment that you have. I had a few questions on um, some of the parts, and so I decided let's just do a walkthrough, and that way uh, if you have any questions on any parts, hopefully this video will answer those for you. So again, this is prep homework number two. Let's take a look at the first section. Identify the numerical size of each interval. Numerical size just refers to the number. Okay, remember that's based solely on spelling. So in this first example, F to D, if we're thinking F to D, ignore the sharps and flats, accidentals, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's a six. That's why there's a six. If you look at the next one, E to F, one, two, that would be a second, and so on and so forth. Looking at the second section, identify compound and simple intervals. Remember, compound intervals refers to intervals larger than an octave. Simple intervals refer to intervals an octave or smaller. Okay. So uh, again, if you look here, they're saying identify compound intervals, numeric size for each of these compound intervals. That's intervals that expand more than an octave. Identify the numerical size of a simple interval to which it is equivalent. And remember to do this, all you have to do is subtract seven. So for example, if you're dealing with a ninth, just subtract seven, and that means a ninth would be interval of a second. If you've got a tenth, minus seven equals a third, so on and so forth. So in this first example, if you look here, we have C sharp to D. This is a pretty massive interval here. Now, if we reduce the size by an octave, you'll notice that it's actually C to D. Ignore the sharp. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's a ninth minus seven is a second. Basically, we just drop the top note an octave. If you end up with a second. That's another way to do this, is you can just take these compound intervals, these large intervals, and just reduce them until they are an octave or smaller in distance. So for example, if I have C, to E here, I'll just drop E, 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 it's a third, one, two, three, okay? So that's an easy way to determine what it is as well. Let's take a look at the next section here, okay? All right, section four, identifying seconds and thirds. Um, in this case, they're asking you to identify the numeric value, the size, as well as the quality, diminished, minor, major, augmented, Okay. You can use the D for diminished. You can also use the degree symbol. You can use capital A for augmented. You can also use the plus symbol. Or if you want to do shorthand DIM or AUG, that's fine as well. All of those are universally accepted. So in this first example, we have an A to a B, which is a second. It's a B flat, which means there's only one half step. One half step is a minor second. If you need to review that, we have a video to go over that again. And, and the second one, let's do one more, treble clef, that's A sharp to C sharp. A to C, that's a third, so I'm gonna write that first. And then, now I'm gonna do A sharp, C sharp, and count the half steps, one, two, three, three half steps, makes a minor third, okay? Example number five, identifying fourths and fifths. We do the same thing here. Remember that the intervals of fourth and fifths can either be perfect, diminished, or augmented. They cannot be minor or major. So in this case, the first example, F to C, that's a fifth, and it's a C sharp. So we count the half steps, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's one more half step larger than a perfect fifth, which has seven half steps. Therefore, this is augmented, hence the A5. If I look at the second example here, B to E is a fourth. And then if I count the half steps, one, two, three, four, between B and E flat, that's four half steps. Remember, a perfect fourth, that's five half steps. So this would be a diminished fourth, okay? You can also write D4, or you can write DIM4, okay? So on and so forth. Number six, identifying sixths and sevenths. Six and sevenths, like seconds and thirds, can be major, minor, diminished, or augmented. Same steps. In the given example, you have E to C, that's a sixth. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's a C sharp. Let's count the half steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay? Nine half steps, that is a major sixth. Okay, remember nine half steps makes a major six. Eleven half steps make a major seventh. 
Next example of B flat to A. Okay, B to A, it's a seventh. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, if we count the half steps, we'll notice it's one half step smaller than a perfect octave. One half step smaller than a perfect octave. A perfect octave is 12 half steps apart, is 11 half steps. Therefore, this is a major seventh. Okay, so that's how you'll do that page. Let's take a look at the second page. Write each interval above the given note. So we're writing above. So in the first example, we have B. Okay, we need to write a fifth above, which is going to be some form of F. And then if we count the half steps, a perfect fifth should have seven half steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it must be F sharp. In the second example, we're given an E flat. We're asked to write a minor third higher. So first, we need to write a third above that. A third above E is going to be G. And then we need to count the half steps. So we have E flat. Now let's count. One, two, three. Three half steps is a minor third. This needs to be a G flat. Let's take a look at the next example. Same thing, but now we're writing the interval below the given note. So we're given E. Okay. Down a fifth. One, two, three, four, five is an A. Count the half steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven half steps is a perfect fifth. So we don't need to add any accidentals. Next example, they're asking for a diminished fifth. Okay, a fifth below D is going to be one, two, three, four, five, G. So I'm going to draw a G here. Diminished fifth has six half steps. We count one, two, three, four, five, six. That needs to be a G sharp. Next example, identify each interval by size and quality, then write its inversion. So we have uh, several things and then identify the size and quality of the inversion. Okay, So this is pretty, there's a little trick here for this. When you invert in an interval, its quality, if it was minor, will always become major. If it was major, it will become minor. If it's perfect, it stays perfect. If it's diminished, it becomes augmented. And augmented becomes diminished. Okay, So when you invert, it looks kind of like this. Minor inverts to major. Major inverts to minor. Okay? And we just can just do a, a double-sided arrow. Minor becomes major, major becomes minor. Diminished flips with augmented. And perfect stays perfect. Okay? Now, when you invert a second, you end up with a seventh, and vice versa. A third inverts to a sixth, and vice versa. A fourth inverts to a fifth, and vice versa. A unison inverts to an octave, vice versa. If you add all of these numbers together, 2 plus 7 is 9. 3 plus 6 is 9. 4 plus 5 is 9. 1 plus 8 is 9. So inversions always add up to 9. If you ever forget, just use that trick to remind yourselves. Now let's take a look at this first example. They give us G sharp to C sharp. G to C is a fourth. We count the half steps. One, two, three, four, five. Five half steps is a perfect fourth. Invert this. To invert this, there's, there's two ways we can invert it. We can move the bottom note higher, or we can move the top note lower. In this case, they've decided to move the, um, the bottom note higher. Understand, the result will be the same. It doesn't matter which note um, you move. It's going to end up being the same result. I'll show you what I mean. So in this case, we end up with a C-sharp, G-sharp. Now, let's say we maintain the G-sharp, and this time we move the C-sharp lower. Notice, we still have C-sharp, G-sharp. The only difference is it's in a different octave, but the notes are the same. C to G is a fifth. C-sharp to G-sharp is seven half steps, therefore it's a perfect fifth. We don't even need to calculate that, though, because we know that when you invert a perfect fourth, you end up with a perfect fifth. Because remember, fourths invert to fifths, and perfect intervals remain perfect. Let's take a look at the next one. E to G-sharp. E to G is a third. How many half steps are there? Four. Four half steps make a major third. If we invert this, and I'll just keep this simple, I'll keep the G-sharp, and I'll move the bottom note higher. Okay? Thirds invert to a sixth, because 3 plus 6 is 9, or 9 minus 3 is 6. It's a major interval. When you invert a major interval, it becomes minor. 
We could check this. If you count the number of half steps, you will find that it is eight half steps and not nine half steps. If we take a look at the next example, D to F. D to F is also a third. It's a D flat to F, but if we count the half steps, there are four half steps, therefore it's a major third. Keep the F, move the D flat up an octave. If you invert this, you're also going to end up with a sixth, and it will change to minor. Let's take a look at the next example. For each interval, write one interval that is enharmonically equivalent. There may be several possibilities, and give the size and qualities of both intervals. So this is, this is, there are a lot of answers you can give on this one. Enharmonic simply means it's a different spelling for the same pitch, or the same key on the piano. Okay? So, for example, I can call this note F sharp, because it's a half step above F, and I can call this G flat, because it's a half step below G. I can also call this E double sharp, because it's a whole step above E. So this note has three possible names, E double sharp, F sharp, G flat. Okay? Some keys only have two possible names. For example, this black key can only be G sharp or A flat, because there are no triple sharps and there are no triple flats. Um, so anyways, depending on what you choose to do, it's going to change the quality and the size of the interval. In the first example, um, they give us E flat to C sharp. E to C, if you just count the white keys, one, two, three, four, five, six, is a sixth. So hence the sixth. If we count the, in, uh, the number of half steps between E flat and C sharp, you'll find there are ten half steps, which makes this an augmented sixth. If we, if we then change one of the notes, okay, so they change one note that is to an enharmonic equivalent. So E flat can also be D sharp. Well, D sharp to C sharp, D to C, is no longer a sixth. It's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a seventh. And if we count the half steps here, we'll notice that there are ten half steps. Eleven half steps makes a major seventh. Ten half steps make a minor seventh. Now, the way to think of this. A minor seventh is a whole step smaller than a perfect octave. Here's D to D, a perfect octave. We go down a half step and another half step. That gives us a minor seventh. Okay. Now there are many ways you could have done this. They could have given us, let they could have kept the E flat and changed the top note to a D flat. Like this. That would have still stayed, remained a minor seventh in this case. All right. Um, I recommend not doing anything um, too crazy because you will find intervals that don't necessarily exist. So just modify one note for these guys and you should be fine. Let's do one more together. So number two, we have F to G sharp. F to G is a second. If we count the half steps, we'll find that there are three half steps, which makes this an augmented second. If we change one of the notes to its enharmonic equivalent, let's in this case change the G sharp to an A flat because G sharp is also A flat. Now we have a third. How many half steps are in this third? Three half steps. What kind of third has three half steps? A minor third. So what they're showing you here is that you do have intervals that are enharmonically equivalent to one another. They're enharmonic intervals. Okay. So augmented sixths and minor sevenths are enharmonic. Augmented seconds and minor thirds are enharmonic. And you might be wondering, well, what, what gives? If they're the same intervals, if they sound the same, why do we even have options? Why wouldn't it always be a minor third, or always a minor seventh, or always an augmented second? And, and it all has to do with how our ears perceive the sound. Okay? It depends on context. So, for example, I can, I can show you how this would work. So let's give this example right here, F to G sharp. Well, depends what key am I, I'm in. If I'm the key of A harmonic minor, okay, F and G sharp is going to sound dissonant, right? Doesn't sound so um, consonant. However, if I am in the key of F minor, the same two notes, F and A flat in this case, sound consonant. It's because a function is different in relation to the context. In the key of A minor, that's going to sound dissonant. In the key of F minor, it's going to sound like a very typical sound. Okay, So that's why we need these different spellings. All right, let's take a look at the next example here. 
write the intervals, the scales are given for reference. Okay, the three major thirds in G major. So what is it asking here? Okay, they're asking us to find the thirds that are actually major. All right. So how are we going to do this? You're going to just look for thirds. Here's a third. G to B is a third. Another third is going to be A to C. Another third is going to be, maybe I should have did it this way, B to D, C to E, D to F sharp, and I'm running out of colors, E to G. And all you're going to do is determine which of these are major. So let's say G to B, let's compare G to B. One, two, three, four. It sounds major. It is major. So that's one of them right there. G to B is one of our major thirds. What about A to C? How many halves is this? One, two, three, that's a minor third? No. E to D, one, two, three, minor third. And so there are two more that you need to find on this. Look at the next one, the sixth perfect sixths, I mean perfect fifths, excuse me, in D minor, natural minor, okay? So we're doing the same thing, compare your fifths. So one, two, three, four, five, that's D and A. Then you're going to compare E and B flat. Then you can compare F and C. Then you're going to compare G and D. And this scale actually continues. Then we're going to compare A and E. Imagine the scale continues. And then you're going to compare, running out of colors again, B flat and F. And then you'll even have one more, C and G. Okay? Because I basically, I'm just taking the notes of the scale and I'm comparing. You can do it this way. Another way you can visualize it is this. Just draw a note of fifth above it. Here's a fifth, 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 and a fifth. That's the same as the first one, so you don't really need that one. And we add the B flat since we are in D natural minor, which is the relative minor to F major, which has one flat, a B flat. So just go through here and we figure out which of these fifths are perfect. Okay, so D to A, it sounds perfect, probably is. E to B flat, probably doesn't, it sounds a little dissonant. So you can listen to these and determine which ones are um, perfect. And so that is the overview of your homework assignment. I hope this answers any questions you may have. If it doesn't, feel free to leave me a comment in the comment section or shoot me an email, and I will do what I can to assist you further. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video.